The recent exit of Vince McMahon from WWE has meant that a lot of performers can now breathe a heavy sigh of relief when it comes to their future direction in the company. And the reason for this is because, prior to Triple H taking over as the head of creative, there was a definite sense that no matter how good of a run someone had down on NXT, there was a pretty good chance the boss was going to screw them up once they'd moved on to Raw or SmackDown. Yes, it's been one of the biggest critiques of WWE over the last few years, but which wrestlers experience the most egregious examples of this? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into Wasted Potential, NXT's Biggest Failed Call-Ups. And if we're going to start somewhere, where better to start than with perhaps the biggest missed opportunity from all of the black and gold call-ups over the last few years? Because when it comes to Aleister Black, turning him into a huge star should have been easy. Yes, after having built a nice reputation for himself on the European indie scene throughout the years prior, Tommy End knew exactly how to get himself over. So when he was signed up to an NXT contract in June of 2016, at this point being rechristened Aleister Black, he would have no problem creating excitement everywhere he went. Of course, part of that was due to his gothic Aleister Crowley-inspired character and martial arts-based in-ring style, two elements of his personality which, when combined together, created something truly magic. And with fans immediately getting behind this then, it wouldn't be long before Black was working his way up the ranks of the developmental brand, with him rising so fast here that, by April 7, 2018, he'd have become NXT Champion after defeating Andrade Cien Almas at TakeOver New Orleans. Unfortunately though, despite having all the momentum in the world by the time he was called up to the main roster the following year, things would quickly stall when, upon failing to win the tag team titles with Ricochet at WrestleMania 35, he'd be drafted to SmackDown, where he'd spend the next few months seemingly stuck in a dark room cutting promos on no one in particular. That's right, it became apparent at this point that Vince McMahon didn't really know what to do with the Dutch Destroyer, and so, after putting him in a brief mid-card feud with Cesaro, he'd move him over to Raw, where he'd disappear back into his dark room once more, all while his relevance slipped away each and every week. So realizing that he was going to get nowhere under this regime then, Black would make the jump to All Elite Wrestling in July of 2021, there immediately entering into a main event program with Cody Rhodes. That said, in the months following this, a back injury and a subsequent hesitation from AEW boss Tony Khan to push him as a singles act would see Black be moved into the trios division alongside Brody King and Buddy Matthews instead. Of course, when it comes to other failed NXT call-ups who ended up jumping ship to AEW, however, well, they'd have a much better time. But then, given how talented Keith Lee is, this should come as little surprise to anyone. Yes, on the face of it, Lee should have been perfect for Vince McMahon. After all, he's big, he's athletic, and he can cut a promo in his compelling Fraser Crane cadence. So it seemed like a no-brainer then that, after he was signed up to the black and gold brand in May of 2018, it would be a quick path between there and the main event scene on the main roster for him. And at least initially, things appeared to be going this way as, after spending a year and a half working his way up the ranks, Lee would defeat Roderick Strong to win the North American Championship on January 22, 2020. Then after that, a cameo appearance in the Royal Rumble, which seemed to impress Vince McMahon greatly, would lead him to unifying the North American and World titles down on NXT when he pinned Adam Cole on July 8th of that same year. But this would end up marking the big man's high point during his time with WWE, as despite things initially looking bright when he was brought up to the main roster full-time not long after this, health issues would see him have to take time off TV for a while. And when he returned following that, the boss, seemingly having lost interest in his new toy, would try to rebrand him as Bearcat Lee, a pretty awful gimmick that likely would have done more to harm his career than to help it if it were not so short. Of course, the only reason it was short was because, in November of 2021, Lee would be released from the company, with him at this point signing with AEW, where he would become tag team champion alongside Swerve Strickland. That said, while Keith Lee has been able to prove his old boss was wrong about him as a result of his subsequent success elsewhere, he wasn't the first person to see little in a main roster push with WWE and use this as his reasoning for jumping over to Tony Khan's promotion. No, in fact, way back when that company was first getting started, they'd sign a man who had, during his time up north, gone by the name of Adrian Neville. 
And while he might be better known as Pac today, back in 2012, it was Neville who would begin setting the wrestling world on fire when, after signing a developmental contract with NXT at this point, he'd begin putting on stellar performance after stellar performance, all of which eventually led to him becoming that brand's champion in March of the following year. Unfortunately, though, despite being the reigning king on the black and gold brand for 287 days after this, when he was called up to the main roster in March of 2015, things would quickly fall apart. As being only 5'8 in height, he was immediately pigeonholed as a cruiserweight by Vince McMahon, with this pretty much killing his potential of rising anywhere past the mid-card in WWE. Sure, he would get a lengthy run as the cruiserweight champion between 2016 and 2017, but with that division being considered so secondary by main roster management, it wasn't long before Neville began growing frustrated, with him eventually requesting his release after being asked to lose to backstage heat magnet Enzo Amore. Luckily for him though, following this, he would get a second lease on life when he became an OG member of the AEW roster, with him here getting to have classic matches against the likes of Kenny Omega, all while becoming an All-Atlantic and Trios champion. And it was perhaps seeing the success that people like Pac and Keith Lee were having in this company which convinced yet another failed NXT call-up to sign on the dotted line with Tony Khan herself recently. Of course, had Vince McMahon known how to use her though, there would have been no need for Ember Moon to do this at all. Yes, she may not be as big of a star as Becky Lynch or Sasha Banks, but Moon could easily hold her own with either of those women in the ring something she's been proving since she first got her start way back in 2007. So when she was signed up to an NXT contract in September of 2015, Triple H would immediately set about harnessing her abilities and pushing her to the top of that brand's women's division, with it not being long before she found herself in a feud with then women's champion Asuka. And after a couple of failed attempts to get the better of the Empress of Tomorrow, it would be on November 18th of 2017 that the up-and-comer finally got her hands on the title, with her from there going on to defend it against the likes of Shayna Baszler. Of course, despite all her success on the black and gold brand though, the main roster would be a far different story as, with Vince McMahon's frequently erratic booking, it made it hard for anyone other than a select few to gain a foothold with fans. And this would end up hurting Moon more than most between 2018 and 2020, because with her never seeming to get any sustained storylines to sink her teeth into, she'd end up being returned to NXT in September of 2020, only to then get released altogether the following year. But while she's since gone on to have more success in AEW as a recent challenger to Jade Cargill's TBS title, another woman whose NXT call-up failed to gain steam has instead returned to her old stomping ground of Impact. And while this may be a much smaller platform for her, Chelsea Green seems much happier than when she was under the eye of Vince McMahon. Sure, she was never going to be one of the top stars of his women's division, but given she'd already proven that she could get over with her prior hot mess gimmick in TNA, as well as her brief time in NXT where she'd become a member of the Robert Stone brand, she deserved better than being stuck in lower mid-card hell over on SmackDown when she was drafted there in November of 2020. In fact, so low was her profile here that she would barely ever appear on TV at all. And while a broken wrist did account for part of this, there's really no excuse for the fact that, throughout pretty much the entirety of what remained of her run, she was completely AWOL, not even getting a chance to prove that she had what it took, with her eventually being released altogether in April of 2021. Still though, for as disappointing as this was, at least Green could take solace in the fact that she wasn't the only NXT call-up being wasted at this point, because around about the same time as this was happening, Karrion Cross was crashing and burning in spectacular fashion. And this one was particularly shocking because, even more than Keith Lee, Cross looked like he'd been bred in a lab to be a Vince McMahon guy, what with his size and muscle making him look like a villain ripped straight out of the 80s. On top of that, with the buxom blonde by his side in the form of Scarlett Bordeaux, it seemed like there was no chance he could fail on the main roster, especially as prior to this, he'd had a successful run on NXT, which saw him become that brand's world champion on two separate occasions between 2020 and 2021. Unfortunately though, once he was called up to the main roster in July of the latter year, he'd quickly find himself struggling when, in his debut match, he'd be booked to lose to Jeff Hardy in less than five minutes. Then, to make matters worse, as the weeks went on, he'd have everything that got him over taken away from him as he lost his valet, his entrance, and his ring gear in short succession. 
So it really should have come as no surprise then that after botching his debut so massively, Vince McMahon would decide to cut him from his contract not long after. That said, with Vince now gone, Triple H has taken the opportunity to bring Cross back into the fold in recent weeks, with it currently looking like he's heading for an eventual showdown with Roman Reigns at some point down the line. But not everyone who failed on the main roster then got fired from the company has had a second chance to return as of yet, because when it comes to someone who Cross recently worked for as part of his Control Your Narrative promotion, EC3 is still waiting for that second chance. Of course, EC3 is another one who had the muscular look and verbal skills that should have made him a slam dunk on the main roster of WWE. For some unknown reason though, after he'd built up a name for himself in TNA as both a former world champion and grand champion, then made the jump to NXT where he'd become a top player on that brand's mid-card, Ethan Carter III would immediately be buried upon his arrival on Raw in 2019. Seriously, this was worse than anything else on this list, as EC3 never even got the opportunity to get over. Now, while some were given bad gimmicks, they were at least given the chance to make these work. With Carter, though, he'd been sent straight down to the comedy 24-7 title division pretty quickly after debuting, meaning that no one would ever take him seriously any time he appeared on screen. And with it being visibly evident that he'd stopped caring at this point, it was no surprise that he'd be cut in April of 2020, leaving him to go it alone and start his own Fight Club-inspired promotion, Control Your Narrative, a promotion which hasn't met with much success critically or commercially. That said, he has a job somewhere right now, the same of which can't currently be said for our next entry, Bo Dallas. Yes, Bo Dallas was likely never going to be a main eventer on Raw or SmackDown, but that didn't mean he didn't have something which could have gotten him a nice spot in the upper mid-card as, while he was down in NXT between 2012 and 2014, he'd build a heel character who delusionally saw himself as the brand's top babyface, someone who could show fans the way forward if they would only believe in him. Unfortunately though, once he was called up to SmackDown in May of the latter year, nothing would really be done with this potentially fun gimmick, as with Vince McMahon apparently not seeing anything in it, he'd relegate Dallas to the role of comedy jobber for the most part. And while he would occasionally get semi-notable roles on the show, such as when he was part of The Miz Taraj or The Social Outcasts, it always felt like he was a background player in these, with any potential he had never really being exploited. But while some others are now beginning to realize their own potential under Triple H's new regime, Bo will sadly never get a chance to do this, because after suffering a serious neck injury in January of 2020, he'd be forced to retire from in-ring competition altogether. Yes, it's sad that we'll never get to see what the Bo Leave gimmick might have been able to do on the main roster had it been given a proper chance. That said, at least he can watch as others find better opportunities in 2022 WWE. And that's especially lucky for the Viking Raiders because when they were first called up in 2019, it would be quite the experience for them. Of course, they'd already made a name for themselves in both Ring of Honor and New Japan Pro Wrestling in the years prior to this, where they'd gone by the moniker of War Machine. Then, when they signed with NXT in 2018, they make an immediate impact upon defeating the Undisputed Era to become that brand's tag team champions. And the fact that their name had been changed to the War Raiders by now didn't even seem like that big of a deal because, while it might not have sounded as cool as War Machine, it still was a decent enough name for the team. That said, once they were called up to the main roster in April of the following year, Vince McMahon would decide he didn't really like the sound of the War Raiders. And that was why he would take to naming the team the Viking Experience instead something which pretty quickly turned the duo into a laughingstock amongst fans. So bad was it in fact that even when they altered their name again to the Viking Raiders soon thereafter, the damage would already be done and no one would take the once feared duo seriously anymore. But then, given the state of WWE's main roster tag team division at that point, it was unlikely they'd have a real chance to get over no matter what they were called. So that's why it's lucky for them that, with Triple H now in charge, he seems much happier to push the duo as a more serious threat again, though how high their ceiling will be remains to be seen. Whatever happens though, it certainly can't be any worse than what took place back when another tag team was called up from NXT to the main roster in 2014, because despite being a fun 80s style throwback act, the Ascension were pretty much dead on arrival, 
Sure, they were never the best tag team in the world, especially not on the black and gold brand where the likes of DIY, American Alpha, and The Revival would regularly be tearing it up by a certain point. Despite this, however, what they had were gimmicks which stood out and which really should have appealed to Vince McMahon, given his liking for cartoon-style characters, that is. Unfortunately, though, it seems the boss never really took to the duo as, even if they looked like a modern-day incarnation of the Road Warriors, they'd be inexplicably buried pretty hard soon after their main roster debut when, on the January 19th, 2015 episode of Raw, the NWO, the New Age Outlaws, and the APA would all take turns at tearing them to pieces, making it clear that they were no threat to anyone on the roster. And with this being established in the fans' minds then, it wouldn't be long before Connor and Victor, the two men behind the team, would be reduced to jobber status as they regularly found themselves on the losing end of whatever match they had that week. So by the time they were finally released from their contract in 2019 then, it was almost a mercy for them, as this allowed the duo to return to the indie circuit and try to repair some of the damage which had been done. And as it happens, using the indies to try and repair their reputation is something another team has been forced to do after their main roster call-up in WWE failed so badly. Who's this? Why, it's the Authors of Pain, of course. Of course, the Authors of Pain are another group who really should have succeeded under Vince McMahon's watch, as with them also looking like something straight out of the Hulkamania era, they appeared to be right up his alley at first glance. And it wasn't as if Triple H wasn't a fan of them either because during their run on NXT between 2016 and 2018, they'd become tag team champions after defeating DIY at TakeOver San Antonio. On top of that, they'd also gain a huge boost to their credibility when Paul Ellering, former manager of the Road Warriors, started appearing by their side, guiding them on their path of destruction each and every week just as he had done for Hawk and Animal years before. Unfortunately, though, once the act made it to the main roster in April of 2018, Ellering would be removed after the boss seemingly decided he was too old, with him quickly being replaced by Drake Maverick at this point. And while Maverick would help the AOP to briefly win the Raw Tag Team titles soon after that, things would soon go downhill from there, as following this, they'd be reduced to the role of lackeys for Seth Rollins, all before being released from their contracts in September of 2020. But at least Akam and Razor can take some solace in the fact that while their main roster run may not have gone as well as they'd hoped, it didn't go as bad as Sanity's did. Because when they were moved up from NXT in 2018, the whole act pretty much fell apart right away. Yes, while on the black and gold brand they'd been a feared stable of heels made up of Eric Young, Killian Dane, Alexander Wolfe, Sawyer Fulton, and Nikki Cross, with Young and Wolfe at one point winning the tag team titles from the Authors of Pain, by the time the group made it to SmackDown, Carlson and Fulton would be separated from the pack, and the three remaining members would be treated like little more than jobbers to the stars. In fact, so bad would things get that, after being almost completely absent from TV for most of the year following their debut, Sanity would lose to The Miz in a handicap match, making them look like absolute failures in the process. So perhaps it was for the best then that they'd disband completely soon after this, with each of the three members going their own way, as Young went to Raw, Dane returned to NXT, and Wolf moved over to NXT UK. When it comes to our next entry today, however, he'd simply refused to give up after his failed start on the main roster. And as a result of this attitude then, he's been able to carve himself a spot out in the mid-card division on Raw in the years since. That said, when it comes to someone as glorious as Bobby Roode, he really could have been so much more if he was used right. Hell, he'd already proved this in TNA and NXT, where he became a world champion in both promotions. During his time in the black and gold brand, in fact, he'd go as far as to dethrone the mighty Shinsuke Nakamura, one of the greatest in-ring wrestlers of all time, in order to earn the title. But despite having the look and in-ring style which should have been right up Vince McMahon's alley, once he joined the SmackDown brand in August of 2017, things would quickly falter for the glorious one as there, he'd be portrayed as more of a mid-card act, one good enough to win the United States title, but nowhere near the level of real main event stars such as Roman Reigns or AJ Styles. And this would leave him hanging in limbo for a while then, as despite being a very skilled performer, Rude rarely had anything to work with. That said, in the years since, he's been able to fill a role as a bit of a tag team specialist on account of his partnerships with both Chad Gable and Dolph Ziggler, so at least in that sense, he's not been completely wasted like so many others have. 
But as with everyone else we've mentioned on this list, his legacy in WWE will likely go down as someone who, had he come around just a few years later than he did, would have likely had a much easier transition under Triple H. That said, with Vince McMahon being in charge at that point and seemingly having forgotten how to create any stars in his later years, they'll unfortunately forever be remembered as failed call-ups.